Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Good morning again. I invite you to read, keep your Bibles open to Psalm 139, please. And let's begin with prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, again, how we thank you for who you are, who you are, that awesome, infinite God. We thank you, Lord, for all your qualities. We thank you, Lord, that you made us so well, that you made us with that love and you made us with that knowledge. And I pray, Lord, that we will remember that. I pray, Lord, that we will appreciate that. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you might use this message today to encourage us to serve you with all that we have. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to emphasize two verses, verses 13 and 14, if you would, please. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We all know that we have an awesome God who had an awesome creation. It is amazing the way God created everything. And that includes you and I. Fearfully and wonderfully made in the sense of reverently, fearfully in the sense of reverently made. NIV puts this, you knit me together. One of the other versions puts, you wove me. God knitted us, wove us, created us in a very fearful, reverent, and wonderful way. He created us with that infinite love, that infinite knowledge, that infinite imaginable creativity, and of course, with great, great precision. You know, you and I marvel at the creation that we see all around us. And we should, because it's a marvelous creation. But sometimes we take for granted the way God created us, the way he created the human being. And I want us to think about that for a little bit and how we can use that to serve him. We have an incredible physical creation. You know that. Look at the stars and the planets and the constellations, and we get all excited about space travel, and of course uh, we should. Uh, we love the beauty of a sunrise or sunset or, or a rainbow. Uh, the majesty, the majesty of the mountains, the canyons, the badlands out, out uh, in the southwest, and all those types of things, the sand dunes, uh, the state parks, the national parks, just a beautiful creation. We like to go and walk beside the ocean. We like to listen to the waves. We, uh, see the rivers, we see the waterfalls and all that. It's just amazing. Amazing, awesome God made an amazing, awesome creation. It just boggles my mind how someone can look at creation and not believe in God. Of course, the sun is in the perfect location. God put it there. Of course. Of course, uh, we have the right mixture of oxygen and nitrogen in the air. God made them that way. Of course that sunlight shines through the raindrops so we get those beautiful rainbows. That's the way God created them, of course. Uh, we appreciate them. I hope we appreciate them. But again, sometimes we don't appreciate or recognize the wonder that God did when he created you and I. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Think about the different parts of the human body. The brain, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the feet, the hands, the heart, just absolutely amazing. Get even smaller, the cells, the arteries, the veins, the bones, the muscles, the diversity that's there, the balance that is there, 
the uh, senses of uh, the five different senses uh, that we have. And all these work together in a beautiful way. It is magnificent. No wonder David said, I praise the Lord when I think about God's creation. This is not going to be a scientific message on anatomy. I'm not the one that's able to do that. But I want us to think about them for four or five minutes to lead into the main part of the message. Think about your brain. Did you ever use your brain to think about your brain? The greatest computer ever made. It is amazing. I know that, Kevin, that mine malfunctions once in a while. Cindy would probably say it malfunctions a lot. But think about your brain. Something you learned in the first grade, 20, 40, 70 years ago, you still remember. You're traveling along a road that you haven't been on for 15, 20, 25 years, and you come to a bend in that road, and you know absolutely that around that bend, there's a beautiful covered bridge. You don't need a GPS to tell you that. You don't need a road map to tell you that. Your brain tells you that. God put it there, and God lets you remember. You can use your brain for simple things in mathematics. Two and two are four. Twelve divided by two is six. You can use them for complicated things like algebra and calculus and trigonometry. You can use your brain to store facts and facts and facts. Think about the number of facts that are in your brain. You can use your brain to learn languages and to, and to communicate in them. The computer that God put there. The first computer was not made by by Google or a Hewitt Packard or Macintosh or Radio Shack, the first computer ever made was made by God. And you put it up here in your head. And in fact, I guess you could say it was the first laptop as well, because Adam took that with him as he, when he left the garden. Think about your eyes. With your eyes, you're able to see that beautiful creation that we just talked about. You're able to see people that you love. You are able to see paintings that are gorgeous. You're able to see things like uh, these stained glass windows. You're able to see Christmas lights and what a joy they bring to us. And you're able to see something like dangerous ahead of you. You've got to be careful. You've got to take it easy. But don't, you don't just see the image. Think about the process. That image goes into your lens, I guess, and around your optic nerve and to your brain. So you're not, uh, you're not just seeing a flower. You know whether it's a carnation or a rose or a bachelor button. You're not just seeing the Christmas light. You know whether it's green or blue or orange or yellow or red. You're not just seeing a traffic sign. You know whether it's a stop sign or a yield sign. Well, hopefully you know that. <laughs> or you might be hiking on the long trail, and as you look ahead to put your foot down, you know whether your foot is going on a safe place or a dangerous place. Your ears. Think about your ears. You can hear a symphony. You can hear special music like Joe just gave us. You can hear a baby's first words. A baby can recognize his mother's voice. You can hear thunder. You can hear those waves on the shore. You can hear a siren. You can hear a cry for help. And again, that process, it goes to the brain. You might be in another room and you hear a guy talking. You can't see them, but you know that it's Kevin talking and not Bill that process that you, that you have. You can tell whether it's me singing or Cindy singing. You may, you may not need a special help for that, but... Simple thing. You know whether it's a horse neighing or a cow mooing, or more complicated. You know whether it's a cat meowing or a cat bird or a mockingbird. The ear that God has given to us. Cindy and I lived in Alaska for two and a half years when I was in the Air Force, and we made a lot of Christian friends up there. And we left, oh, what, 45, 50 years ago. About 20 years ago, one of them called me up on the phone. This was before we had caller ID. And I had not talked with him for 25, 30 years. I picked up the phone, I said, hello. He said, is this Chuck? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, I bet you don't know who this is. And in one second, I said, oh, yeah, it's John Hoover from Alaska. That's amazing that, that your brain, that your ears, that how God created us that way. Your mouth, the words that come out of your mouth, they don't have to be just gibberish. They can be thoughts. They can communicate. You can tell somebody that you love them. You can explain things. You can laugh. You can cry. You can cheer. Hopefully, bud, you're not cheering for the Yankees, but 
but you can't hear. God understands that some people get confused, but. <laughs> what about your feet? Think about how flexible your feet are, how your feet can walk and how your feet uh, can move. You can go upstairs or down. You can walk from the living room into the kitchen to get a snack from the refrigerator. You can run the first base or the home. You can walk on the balance beam. You can hike on the long trail. You can kick a, a soccer ball or a football. You can do all these things. What about your hands? The hands are so valuable. You can open them. You can close them. You can pick something up very carefully, and you can lay it down very carefully. They're not made of stone. They're made of steel. You can write. You can touch. You can catch a baseball, or a basketball, or a football, or a wiffle ball. In fact, uh, we have a term, term in sports, uh, don't we, Bud? That if uh, someone plays the shortstop like Bud used to do, or Jim O'Neill, or Ozzie Smith, and catches everything that comes their way, or a basketball player goes up high and grabs, grabs the pass and dunks it, or a soccer goalie catches everything that comes their way, we have a term for that. He or she has good hands. Of course they have good hands. God created us with good hands. <clears throat> you can play sports. You can play the piano. You can play drums. You can shake hands. You can encourage somebody with a pat on the back or a hand on the shoulder. Our hands. And of course, our heart. The heart is at the very center of this. It pumps the blood. It keeps life going. You can enjoy those activities that you want to enjoy. You can come to church. You can be healthy. You can visit or be visited. You can go to work. So we're back to this verse. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And think how God did it. Out of mud, out of dirt, God created this human body. Fearfully and wonderfully made. If you've never read that uh, poem by James Johnson, Creation, you need to get a hold of it and read it. Beautiful poem by James Johnson. There's a book out too, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, by Dr. Paul Brandt. And he's a doctor, so he's much better at talking about these things than I am. So again, get a hold of that book. Famous, famous the book. So we have this wonderful creation. Why? Why did God make this creation so fantastic? Well, for one thing, of course, God's a wonderful God. And anything that God does, he does wonderfully. So he made a wonderful creation when he put us together. But Two reasons above that. I want to emphasize the second, but I want to quickly talk about the first. Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> Sometimes my mouth needs water. <laughs> first Corinthians 6, 19, Paul reminds us, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 2.22, Paul repeats that, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God yearns for you and I to put our faith in Christ, to turn to Christ. And when we do that, he gives us two incredible gifts. First of all, he gives us his son as our savior in the eternal life. Secondly, he gives us his Holy Spirit to dwell within. And it wouldn't be right for God's holy, wonderful, fantastic Holy Spirit to dwell in something that would be unworthy. He wants that to be worthy of his spirit. Think about when God had Moses build a tabernacle out in the wilderness. He gave Moses very, very specific instructions. This is how you need to do it. And thankfully, Moses followed those uh, instructions. That tabernacle was not to be just any structure. It was to be a very, very special structure. And when it was finished, what was the crowning touch? The crowning touch was when the Shekinah glory of God entered that tabernacle to dwell with his people, to be present with his people. But it had to be done in a certain way. It had to be done just right. And God wishes, I believe, for this body that's going to have the Holy Spirit dwelling within, if we put our faith in Christ, not to be just anybody, but to be a very, very special structure. 
And so he created us uh, in that way. And the crowning touch, along with the brain, along with the eyes and the ears and the feet and the hands and the heart, the crowning touch for anybody is when that faith in Christ, we have Christ as Savior, and he puts that Holy Spirit within. That's, when the, that's what makes, of course, all the difference. That's why Paul admonishes us in Romans 6, 13, not to use any parts of our body for sinful activities. Don't offer up your body for sinful activities. Don't offer up any parts of your body for sinful activities. We don't want to do that, of course. That would not be fit for the temple of the Holy Spirit. But it also would not be fit for the second thing I want to talk about, and that is to serve God. We want to use all of these wonderful things that God has given to us to serve Him and not to serve sinful activities. Offer to God and not offer to sinful things. Created, made, knitted, woven together to serve the Lord reverently with great, great precision. Let's think about those. Created to serve the Lord. Let's go back to the mind. Let's go back to the brain. Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 5, let your mind be as Christ. Have the same mind as Christ did. Now we know right away, of course, that we can only do that with the grace of God. We can only do that through the gift of his Holy Spirit, through that uh, process of which he uh, sanctifies us. But let have the same mind as Christ did. If you have the same mind as Christ did, I guarantee you, you'll be serving God. That portion in Philippians, second chapter, goes on to talk about Jesus and his humble service. Jesus coming here to serve his Father. Jesus coming here to serve mankind. And we're talking about serving God. If your mind is the same as God, you're going to be serving. If your mind is the same as Jesus, you're going to be doing the will of the Father. You're going to be serving him. Colossians 3.2 let your mind be on heavenly things and not on earthly things. Let's face it, you're going to be acting in activities that you're thinking about. If you're thinking about earthly things and that's all you're thinking about, you're going to be just involved with earthly activities. Unfortunately, if you're thinking of sinful things, you're going to be involved with sinful activities. But if you're thinking about heavenly things and spiritual things, you will be involved with heavenly activities and heavenly things and spiritual things. We need to be thinking spiritual concerns. Philippians 4 8, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure and lovely and admirable, think about those things. Again, what's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. That's what your brain should be thinking about. Thinking about, with that in mind, how can I serve the Lord? Think about the sermon that Pastor Schumann preaches. Think about the Sunday school lesson that you heard. Don't just come here on Sunday morning and sit and listen to the sermon. That's only part one. Part two is to go home, think, and pray about it. Was something in that sermon or something in that lesson wrong? Why? If something and hopefully everything will be right, why was it right? And what can I do about it? How can I apply that to my life? And in fact, when we return to Sunday evening services next month, we're going to be doing that on some of the evening services, applying what Jerry teaches to us on Sunday morning. Think about that uh, devotional message that you read. Think about the verses of Scripture you read. Think about the spiritual gifts that God has so graciously given to you. How to use them. How, how to use those to serve God. Think about the that family or that individual that uh, is grieving, that's without food, maybe without a home, maybe without clothes. What can you do about it? How can you help that person? How can you encourage the pastor? How can you encourage the person sitting next to you? How can you encourage your neighbor? Don't just ignore it, think about it. How can you use your resources, your car, your money, your talents to serve the Lord? What do you see in society that needs to be changed? Think about how you can change that. Think about how to do it. Put your mind to work to serving the Lord. 
What about your eyes? That song that Joe said to us, one of the phrases says, my eyes were made to read God's word. You never get a better use of your eyes than to read God's word. I want to read just a few verses from a psalm that you people know that I love. Psalm 119. Verse 1 of, uh, I'm sorry, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. I love your law. Or I love your word. I'm using my eyes to look at it. I'm using my brain to meditate it. 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Verse 127. Because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold. A love for God's word. If you have that love, use your eyes to read God's word. Use your eyes to read a good Christian book. And there are countless good Christian books out there. Use your eyes to read a Christian magazine. To read a commentary. To read a devotional. To read your Sunday school lesson. Read your eyes to read those letters from the missionaries that Molly does such a good job of sending out email. And if you don't get those email, let Molly know. She'll love to send those to you via email. Or if you can't get email, she puts the hard copy downstairs. Use your eyes to read those letters. And then pray about those people. John, 45, John 4, verse 35. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Open your eyes and look unto the fields. Or look unto the harvest. Use your eyes to do that. Use your eyes to look around you. Who doesn't know Christ? Who's not a believer? How can I help that person come to know Christ? And what Brent was saying this morning goes right along with that. Use your eyes to see the needs of the church. What is needed? Maybe there's a teacher needed in Sunday school. Maybe there's a worker needed in vacation Bible school. Maybe there's some need there. When Bud puts up the assignments for work day, look at that list. Use your eyes to read that list. Where can you fit in? Use your eyes to see your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe one of them is sad. Find out why. Maybe one of them is grieving. Find out why. Maybe one of them is excited. Go to them and join in that excitement. Use your eyes to see people who are hurting. Those people who don't have a home, or don't have clothes, or don't have food, or don't have a friend. Use your eyes to see those people. Are your eyes serving the Lord? Or what about your ears? Using your ears to serve the Lord. Think about it. A year ago, we were talking about opening your eyes and ears to hear the Lord, and we talked about those verses in Revelation where Jesus dictates those seven letters to John to give to the seven churches in Revelation. And at the end of each letter, Jesus says what? He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Well, obviously they had an ear, but some of them weren't using those ears to listen. Some of them were not using those ears to hear that message and to serve. Use your ears to hear a message. Use your ears to hear the word of God being read. Use your ears to listen to that uh, Sunday school teacher. Proverbs 8, 33. Listen to God's instructions. Be wise. Listen to God's instruction. Be wise. Think about God instructing us. That's the greatest instruction you could ever get. Why would you not want to listen to it? Be wise. And the second part of that verse, do not be ignorant. Don't be ignorant of those instructions. Use those. Listen to them. And you'll be serving God. I'm the typical male, I guess. When I buy one of these things that you're supposed to assemble at home, I, I try to put it together and I never do very well at it. And Cindy usually says, uh, did you read the instructions? <laughs> and I say, well, no. Well, those instructions are there to help you out. We have the best instruction book you'll ever get. God's Word. Read. Read it. And then do what it says. Hearing uh, God's message in many, many, many uh, different ways. Listening to good Christian music. Wonderful use uh, of your ears. I'm uh, the world's worst singer. I know that. Or at least I'm the bottom five, somewhere in there. <laughs> but I love 
to listen. I'm a good listener. I love to hear that music. I love to hear Joe and Joe and Molly and Cindy and Linda and Lynn and Shelly and Caroline. Listening to that special music and Millicent tells you so much, tells you so much. The, the congregational songs, you go on YouTube and pick, kick up one of those songs that you've enjoyed so much. Christian music can really be used uh, to, serve, uh, to serve the Lord. And as I am, you don't have to understand the music, but I get a lot out of those words. Right? I don't know what notes Joe is singing, or Cindy, or Linda. I don't know what notes Lynn is singing. I know she's up there somewhere. <laughs> but I know what those words are. I don't know, Shelley, that that song, uh, The Longer I Serve Him, The Sweeter He Grows, has four flats, or two flats, or zero flats. I'm going to sing it flat no matter what. <laughs> but what a wonderful message that is, and we're going to close with that a little bit later. But uh, listening, listen. Use your ears to listen to your brothers and sisters. Maybe you'll hear a need that you can respond to. Maybe you'll hear them laughing, and you can laugh with them. Maybe you'll hear one of them crying, and you can cry with them. Maybe you can hear them praising God, and you can praise God with them. Using your ears to hear people around you, and what they need, and what they have to say. If your eyes and ears are not open, you will miss many opportunities to serve the Lord. What about your mouth? The Bible is full of warnings about the mouth and about speech. It can be like a fire. It can be destructive. It can ruin people. It can be harmful. But it doesn't have to be destructive. It doesn't have to be harmful. You can use your mouth, you can use the words from your mouth to help people, to bless people, to encourage people, to teach people. You can use your mouth maybe to read the Bible to someone who can't read. You can maybe use your mouth to sing some of that music that uh, we've been talking about. Maybe to evangelize. Maybe uh, to cheer up. You can use your mouth to pray. Maybe at our prayer meeting on Wednesday night. So that others can hear. Others can be motivated. So they also can make those same prayers. And of course when you're praying, what are you doing? You're talking to God. And God loves to have you talk to Him. So remember that. You can use that mouth to praise God. To uplift Him. To serve Him. You can use your mouth to give a testimony to others. You can use your mouth to teach. Another verse that I love, in fact, I want to make sure I get it right, Proverbs 25, 11. Go the right way, I'll have it. Proverbs 25, 11. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The word aptly spoken, the word spoken in the right way is like apples of gold in settings of silver. You can enrich somebody's life with one simple, right, proper word. You can encourage somebody. You can help them out. You may not be able to give silver or gold, but you can give a word aptly spoken. You can serve the Lord that way. Are you serving the Lord with your mouth? What about your feet? Another phrase from Joe's song, my feet were made to walk in his footsteps. What an incredible blessing. And what a responsibility. You and I can walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We can walk where he would walk. Where would Jesus walk in the United States? Where would Jesus walk in the state of Vermont? Where would Jesus walk in the Okemo Valley? Think about it, pray about it, and walk in his footsteps. Go where he would go. Psalm 52, 7 talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who proclaim salvation. You can use your feet to do that. You can use your feet to proclaim salvation to proclaim peace, to bring the good news. And guess what? Your feet will be beautiful. You can use your feet to come to a service like this. You can use your feet to come to a fellowship. You can use your feet to come to share, to learn, to give. 
You can use your feet to bring somebody what that person needs. Again, whether it's food or clothes or whatever. You can use your feet to bring somebody a Bible or to bring somebody a track, to bring somebody a devotional. Or maybe God will be using you to use your feet to go into a hazardous situation. But if he's leading you in that, then you're serving the Lord. What about your hands? That song said, my hands were made to serve my neighbor. As you serve your neighbor, you're serving God. To serve him. First Timothy 2.8, lift up your hands in prayer and lift up your hands in praise. What a way to serve the Lord. Lifting up your hands in prayer, lifting up your hands in praise. You can use your Bible, you use your hands to hand a Bible to somebody who doesn't have one. You can use your hands to hand somebody a devotional that needs one. You can use your hands to give somebody an invitation to church, whether it's a regular service or something special like the Hisongs concert uh, next month. You can use your hands to hand somebody a sandwich that's hungry, or to hand somebody a plate of food at our Thanksgiving dinner, or to put the food on that plate, or to help prepare the food out in the kitchen, ways to use your hands. You can use your hands to hand a thirsty soul a cup of cold water. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 42, that a service like that, giving a thirsty soul a cup of cold water, is just worthy and deserving of reward. Why? Because when you are doing that to that person, it's just like you are doing it to Christ. Humble service, serving the Lord. That song that, uh, again, was, my hands were made to serve God's neighbor, maybe to take him to the hospital, maybe to bring him a meal, maybe to mow their lawn, maybe to shovel their walk in the wintertime, maybe, uh, maybe to clean their house. Always that you can show love to your neighbor. What about a church? You can use your hands to help a teacher make visuals if you're talented that way. If you're not talented in making visuals, maybe you can hold that visual while the teacher explains it to the class. You can use your hands to help with baptism. You can use your hands to run the camera or to run the signboard. You can use your hands to build a ramp or to paint a ramp. All ways you can use your hands to serve the Lord. Back in World War II, the German people, unfortunately, the German government, I should say, uh, bombed England so often that many parts of England were left in shreds. There were destruction all over the place. Unfortunately, sadly, many of those were churches and cathedrals. And if you've ever been to Europe, you know that there's some outstanding cathedrals in Europe. After the war was over, they began to rebuild some of those places that had been destroyed, including one particular cathedral I'm thinking of in London. And as they worked painstakingly to put that cathedral back in place, they finally had it all done, except there had been a beautiful statue of Christ. And they, again, very painstakingly, and these were German volunteers who wanted to pay back to England what, what their country had done to them. And they would very, with great patience, put that statue back together again, except when they came to the hands of Christ, they were so shattered in so many little tiny pieces that they couldn't do anything with them. And they said, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And finally they came up with a brilliant idea. They left those hands alone and they put a little sign up there. And it said this, Jesus has no hands but our hands. Jesus has no hands but our hands. Are you using your hands to serve the Lord? And then, of course, that brings us full cycle back to the heart. Everything we've said so far involves the heart. Joshua 22, 5. Serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. Serve him with all your heart. Don't do it, uh, don't fake it. Don't do it reluctantly. Don't do it because you feel that you have to. But do it with all your heart. Do it with love. Do it with gladness. Do it with joy. Do it enthusiastically. And you will be serving the Lord that way. First part of Psalm 139 talks about God knows where I am, God knows what I am doing, and God knows why. 
So when God looks at you, I hope you see somebody that's serving the Lord. And that's serving the Lord lovingly and gladly and joyfully and with all their heart. I didn't ask Joe to do this, but that second song we sang, Near to the Heart of God, is one of my favorite songs. Near to the Heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet, near to the heart of God. A place where we, our Savior, meet, near to the heart of God. The second verse. If you're near to the heart of God, you're near to Jesus, of course, and you will be serving the Lord. Your heart will be telling you to do that. Born to serve the Lord. Use the parts of your body together to serve the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for creating us the way that you did. And I think, Lord, of a hundred other ways you could have made us. You made us in a way that is perfect, of course. And because of that, Lord, we can serve you. And I pray, Lord, that we will lovingly, enthusiastically, gladly, joyfully do all that we can to serve the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.